everybody, this is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar, and what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and take you guys through the uh, pathophysiology of venom, and I know we've been talking about the pathophysiology of uh, snake venom, and again, this is going to be um, the crotalin venom in, in particular, and actually, I think I'll talk about the coral snake venom, and North American coral snake, or the lapids uh, in North America, we'll talk about that as well. But what I want to do is I want to talk about some uh, notable exceptions to the rule. And, and the rule of thumb when it comes to uh, crotalin envenomation in the United States is that the effects of the venom tend to be more proteolytic. Proteolytic. They tend to be more proteolytic effects, and of course, they tend to uh, cause coagulopathies as well. And of course, this is done through the mechanisms that I've already described in uh, prior videos. Um, so your your typical signs and symptoms uh, are are going to be, of course, uh, this is going to be rather painful. You're going to have pain. You're going to have swelling. You're going to have erythema or redness. All right. Uh, you may even have tissue destruction. All right. You're going to have this redness that spreads up. You're obviously going to have your, your you potentially have fang marks as well. Um, you're going to have evidence of potential coagulopathy. So you're going to have a decrease in, in platelets or. Uh, uh, thrombocytopenia, you're going to have um, clotting factor anomalies. Um, so your clotting, uh, your tests of clotting, your PT, your prothrombin time, your partial thromboplastin time, and INR if they happen to do that, your PT, PTT, INR, um, these are all going to be altered. Okay, um, You're going to have potentially have difficulty uh, developing, maintaining good clots. So these patients tend to have you know, swelling, it's painful, uh, they get a lot of redness, they have tissue dis destruction, they develop um, uh, bl uh, little blebs and bullae um, that are filled with, uh, could be kind of bloody cirrhosis fluid, um, might even develop into a compartment syndrome of the extremities particularly. Um, <clears throat> In, in exceptionally severe cases, it can even lead to uh, rhabdomyolysis and uh, all of the other the problems associated with that. Um, and of course, you can have coagulopathy. So this is the more uh, prototypical. These are the more prototypical signs and symptoms that we find with proteolytic types of uh, venom, which more or less most of the pit vipers, most of the, the crotalids in North America tend to present, most of the bites tend to present this way. However, there are some notable exceptions and there are uh, three specific notable exceptions to that rule that I want to talk about. And the first is uh, what's known as the Mojave rattlesnake. The Mojave rattlesnake Alright, the Mojave rattlesnake. Um, the second is the Pacific or the Southern Pacific. The Southern Pacific rattlesnake. All right. And then the third is the Timber rattlesnake. The Timber rattlesnake. And these snakes can have different, ma markedly different manifestations in their venom types, and we've talked about this, how um, there, there, there appears to be an evolutionary advantage to having different types of venom. And we can kind of classify the, this venom. Um, when it comes to the Mojave rattlesnake, we have two general types of Mojave venom. Okay, we have the Mojave A, the Mojave Venom Type A, should be an M-O, <laughs> the Mojave Type A, and the Mojave Type B. All right. And the Mojave Venom A tends to have more neurotoxic 
more neurotoxic presentation, whereas the Mojave B tends to be the more classical uh, proteolytic uh, coagulopathic type of venom that we're, we're more used to. And you can you you have kind of this mi you can have this mixing as well. It's not like it's all or nothing, but in general, uh, certain types of Mojaves uh, tend to have venom that is much more neurotoxic, and then other types that are much more um, proteolytic. Um, the Southern Pacific rattlesnake uh, has uh, has the a Mojave-like venom, and it, it basically its mechanism from what I can. Can, uh, gather is is so remarkably similar that that in a sense you could um, look at the venom of the Southern Pacific rattlesnake very much like Mojave A versus Mojave B, and that venom is going to have a very similar mechanism of action, very similar signs and symptoms, where you can have some venom that's neurotoxic, some venom that's proteolytic. And that trend also continues with the third notable exception, and that is the timber rattlesnake. And the timber rattlesnake actually has several different types of venom. Um, there is the type A venom, which, just like the Mojave, uh, is more neurotoxic. All right. um, you have the type B, which tends to be more proteolytic. Alright, and there's also, they also do have a differentiated type um, where it's A plus B, and you can imagine what that is. It's a, it's a nasty combination of both neurotoxic and proteolytic venoms. And then there is this type C venom, which tends to be weak. Okay, it tends to be weaker, and it doesn't tend to uh, produce significant toxicities like the other types of venom. So these are the notable snakes. Um, there are some people that say that perhaps the timber rattlesnake might be the most toxic or the most venomous uh, of the snakes simply due to the fact that it has very long fangs. All right, they have very long fangs and these particular snakes uh, can have very large venom glands and so they can potentially have a lot of venom. They could pack a big punch. Um, however, this is somewhat offsetted by the fact that these are um, these are pretty chill uh, species of snake in general. They they're pretty chilled out. They you know they're not incredibly aggressive. Um, so you have these two contradicting uh, ways of looking at these these snakes. Um, I, I would say that it's probably, if you're going to get bit, it's probably not necessarily the specific type of snake, but it really comes down to what that, how that, how what's going on with that venom, how that venom works. Okay, so let's kind of get into the, uh, oh, you know what, let's just go ahead and throw up the coral snakes as well. Um, the coral snakes. All right. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one example of the coral snakes in another video, and I actually have some pictures that I'm going to be putting up for you guys as well, uh, so you'll get to see them. But the, the coral snake venom tends to be primarily neurotoxic. All right. Tends to be uh, highly neurotoxic, and it does not tend to have any significant proteolytic or coagulopathic effects. So very different from the crotalids. Okay, so let me just draw this picture again if I can. Uh, so we remember we talked a little bit about the neuromuscular junction and we had the, the distal end of the axon here. Uh, I have my end motor plate. I have the synapse of the neuromuscular junction. All right, and then within the uh, the uh, distal axon, I have vesicles, and those vesicles are full of neurotransmitter molecules. In this case, really what we're talking about is acetylcholine. All right. So the, the elapid, when we talk about neurotoxic venom, the Mojave, uh, the Mo Mojave toxin particularly, uh, Mojave A, um, 
the Mojave venom has a very different mechanism of action from the coral snake venom. The neurotoxicity is very different, even though the neurotoxicity of both types of venom affects neuromuscular transmission. Those effects occur in different areas. So let's just go ahead and talk about the Mojave rattlesnake. The Mojave rattlesnake, the Mojave A venom, if you remember me talking about the calcium channels, okay, so remember I have this, these calcium channels here that allow calcium to rush in, and it is a calcium that um, allows the neurotransmitter vesicles to dock to the active site on the cell membrane here in the distal axon, and then allows them to dock and then allows the fission to occur and then the, the, uh, the membrane kind of merges into the cell membrane and the neurotransmitter molecules can be released. The Mojave venom appears to work via a presynaptic mechanism. So presynaptic would mean that the neurotoxicity is going to occur in this area here before the this is the synapse right here right the actual junction all right so the mechanism of the mojave uh, mojave a venom tends to be pre uh, synaptic and there um, is some pretty good research that it, it appears that it actually poisons okay and maybe i'll make that red since uh, there it actually poisons this area right here, and in, in specifically, it, it appears to attach to uh, what's known as the dihydropyridine receptor, and uh, that is uh, not on the channel itself. It's not the active part of the channel, but it's another part of the channel, and um, when we have binding to the non-active part of a protein enzyme channel, um, we know we call that allosteric uh, allosteric binding, and that binding to non-active sites uh, causes conformational changes in the protein and leads to downstream effects that can inhibit that. And so that's what appears to happen is that we we can bind to that dihydropyridine receptor. Um, and there's some sort of allosteric uh, mechanism that is not at the receptor itself. It's, it's distant from the receptor, but downstream effects of that uh, cause or prevent the flow of calcium normally. And then that prevents the vesicles from docking and from uh, it basically prevents the uh, exocytosis of the uh, neurotransmitter molecules. So what happens is uh, it, it prevents the release of acetylcholine, it prevents presynaptic release of acetylcholine, and so the acetylcholine cannot be released and it cannot attach to those uh, nicotinic M receptors, okay, and here in the, in, in the muscle, and if you remember those nicotinic M receptors are coupled with sodium channels and when they're activated by um, the acetylcholine, they cause the sodium channel to open up that allows sodium to rush into the muscle and causes the muscle to depolarize. Um, so that that is inhibited through um, action um, on the neuron itself. So that's what we believe happens with the Mojave rattlesnake. The coral snake neurotoxin is perhaps a bit more uh, traditional, I suppose, in, in a certain sense, and it it has a a um, some people describe this as a curare-like effect, and, and curare is just a um, a type of uh, uh, plant um, poison that comes from uh, different plants in uh, South and Central America. Um, that's where we first found it. It was traditionally it was used by um, the indigenous uh, populations in those particular countries to hunt. Um, animals, they put it on their arrows, um, this curare, and then they'd shoot the animal with this arrow laced with curare. Curare would get into the bloodstream, and curare would, would paralyze the animal, and the animal would fall out of the tree, and then be able to um, then get the animal and eat it. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, ingesting curare, if you ingest curare, um, you actually digest it. 
uh, digestive enzymes and enzyme uh, digestive enzymes um, uh, break or uh, metabolize the curare into uh, inactive metabolites. So it has to go into your bloodstream for it to work. And that's actually uh, we purified uh, some components of the curare. And one of the one of the active molecules is is a, a medication that was derived from curare in the, I think the fifties and sixties, um, known as uh, tubo curarin. Uh, tubo curarin was one of the first uh, neuromuscular blockers that we used in surgery. We'd administer this tubo curarin, and what it, it does, the tubo curarin, is that it actually attaches. It's it, it's competitive competes with the acetylcholine, it attaches at the uh, nicotinic uh, receptor, attaches it and then just kind of locks into place but does not actually activate the receptor, it just kind of attaches there and blocks it. And if you have enough of this, um, this curare or this uh, tubo curarin, which is a, a derivative uh, derived from uh, the curare, um, then you block all of these receptors and they cannot they can they cannot be activated even though the acetylcholine is being released and you've effectively blocked or prevented this muscle from depolarizing and you cause paralysis these are sometimes in medicine referred to as non depolarizing neuromuscular blockers um, now, uh, tubo curarin was associated with a lot of negative things like histamine release and chemodynamic problems and bronchospasm. And so it's been replaced by newer agents that, that do the same thing. They block the neuromuscular blockers, but they just they, they, they block the nicotinic receptors. They just don't have all the side effects. So, so things like uh, uh, rocuronium, vecuronium, pancuronium, uh, are all examples of newer uh, neuromuscular blockers that have fewer side effects than curare. So why in the hell have I been talking about curare when I should be talking about coral snakes? Well, basically, if you understand how curare in, in one of its active components, the tubo curarin, um, uh, how that can block the, the nicotinic receptor well, the coral snake venom works exactly the same way. It has a curare-like effect. It blocks the nicotinic M, uh, the motor receptors, and prevents okay, it prevents the muscles from depolarizing. So it has a postsynaptic mechanism of action as opposed to the presynaptic mechanism of action that you run into with the Mojave venom. So you, at the end of the day, the the ultimate effect is the same in that you have block blockade, or you're preventing uh, the nervous system from telling the muscles to contract, and you can cause paralysis of the muscles. And the real concern with Mojave, both Mojave and coral snake venom, is uh, the effects that this has on our, our ability to breathe. Okay, respiratory effects it can cause. Uh, hypoventilation, you're not able to oxygenate very well, and you develop respiratory acidosis, you become hypoxic, and you die as a result of that. You might, might even need to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. Now, the in addition to the neurotoxic hit with the Mojave venom, um, another thing you have to worry about is um, a lot of this Mojave venom is not purely neurotoxic. Um, and so you get a good neurotoxic hit with the Mojave venom, and you're also getting some proteolytic stuff going on as well. So you have a patient that they're having all these problems breathing, but then they're having on top of that um, this tissue breakdown, these coagulopathies and these compartment syndromes and the rhabdomyolysis and all the other stuff um, that you would expect to see with proteolytic venom. So um, in particular, these three guys here that can have both neurotoxic and proteolytic venom are very problematic. Um, luckily, there is a, an antidote of sorts, an anti-venom, uh, and possibly two anti-venoms will be available in the next uh, year or so. We'll see. And if you've watched the first video, you would uh, uh, have a heads up there. Okay, I think I've done enough damage for today. I'm going to go ahead and cut the video off here. Hopefully that makes sense. As always, thanks for hanging in there, guys.